Good morning and welcome to Unity Center in Milwaukee. I'm Reverend Mary Gabrielson, the minister here, and it is my joy and pleasure to welcome you into our center to join with us in celebration today and every Sunday. I'd like to begin with a word of prayer, so if you'll join me in prayer. We know that God is a love that has no end and a power that knows no bounds. God's healing power of divine life is restoring, healing, and revitalizing our world in this very moment. We let go of any fears and anxieties, and we affirm that all are safe, healthy, and protected. We bless all those who support us in maintaining vibrant, radiant health. We express divine life in all that we think, say, and do. We bless our global family with radiant health, peace of mind, and abundance and love. And for this, we give thanks in the name and the nature of the indwelling Christ. And so it is. Amen. This last week, my favorite poet developed a great song about the Cobus mask. So I'm going to ask him to sing for us. And Kevin? I'll just stop right now. Thank you for giving me a chance to uh, play a song. So, uh, you know, there's been some disagreement among people about wearing masks and whether it's necessary and whether it's infringement on our individual rights. And so, like any good Christian, I thought, uh, what would Jesus do? And this song just kind of tumbled out. If Jesus was walking the earth today, I'm sure he'd be wearing a mask. He'd be standing six feet away. You wouldn't even have to ask. Because Jesus, Jesus loves us. And he wants us healthy and strong. He wouldn't risk our health and safety Just to try to prove somebody wrong If Jesus was walking the earth today He'd be preaching unity I'm not sure if that's with a little you or a big you Probably a big you Care for our sisters, care for our brothers Nurture our community, cause Jesus, Jesus loves us, and he asks us to be meek, care for the least, protect each other, tend to the homeless and the weak. Jesus was walking the earth the day. I'm sure he'd be wearing that mask. He'd be standing six feet away. You wouldn't even have to ask. Because Jesus, Jesus loves us. And he wants us to love others too. So don't be little. Or cut down those other But they are our neighbors too If Jesus was walking the day He wouldn't mess with politics He'd keep to his message He would not stray Tend to the poor and sick Protect the poor and sick Please wear your mask Thank you. I think that says it all for us in such a wonderful way that we want to be respectful of others, we want to be respectful of ourselves, but we want to be appreciative that everyone has the right to be healthy. And if that means I'm going to be a little bit more uncomfortable wearing a mask, well, so be it, because everybody else is doing the same thing. Unity is an educational movement that was inaugurated by Jesus the Christ 
and we continue in teaching the teachings of Jesus and stri striving to live those to the highest and best of our ability. Let's begin our time together with our statement of faith. There's only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God, the good, omnipotence. In the affirmation for our center. Thank you, God, that we have come to this place to release the past, celebrate the present, and embrace the future in love, peace, harmony, and prosperity. We're going to have a prayer that we call an inclusive prayer for all of those who have made prayer requests that we put into the prayer box or that you may be holding silently in your own mind and heart. So if you will join me in prayer. We have marked this time to shift attention from our plans and concerns to the center of our being in which we know spirit is all. Spirit is everywhere and the essence of everything. In this reality, we concentrate our attention now so we may know spirit is at the center of our being and that we are one as we enter into prayer. I ask that you let my voice be your voice within as I speak the affirmation. I am peace at the center of my being. You are peace at the center of your being. Spirit is peace. I am one with the spirit of peace, breath by breath. I settle into a peace that instills calm, confidence, and courage. There is nothing to do, nowhere to go in this moment of being. I am peace. I listen to inner wisdom and I am guided to live my purpose. You listen to inner wisdom and you are guided to live your purpose. Within my mind and heart, intuition flows as a steady stream, an ever ready sense of direction. Wisdom is natural for me and to me, and I am one with the spirit of wisdom. I choose wisely, purposefully, prayerfully. I am attentive. Healing energy flows throughout my being, renewing my mind and body. Healing energy flows throughout your being, renewing your mind and body. In this moment, I release any thought that lessens well-being. I attune to the spirit of life recognizable as healing, renewing vitality. I live in the flow of healing, renewing vitality. Well-being is my experience as I know the truth of my divine life. God is my source. Freely I give and freely I receive. God is your source. Freely you give and freely you receive. The spirit of God everywhere and the essence of everything is the source of my abundant life. When thoughts of scarcity cloud my vision, I rise by giving freely in a state of gratitude. I appreciate the good I give and receive. My thoughts, words, and actions create a space for peace and love. 
my thoughts, words, and actions create a space for peace and love. I hold the world and all beings in the light of peace and love. Guarding my thoughts, I choose compassion. Measuring my words, I choose encouragement. Preparing my actions, I choose kindness. I am one with the spirit of peace and love, always, and especially in this moment of prayer. And as we complete this period of prayer, we anticipate the hours ahead by intending to remain centered in abundant peace, wisdom, and life. When with God, our source, we embody these divine qualities by which we experience and express the light of the world. And so it is. Amen. Before we hear the words of our daily word, I would like to share with you something that is being done by many of the unity centers and churches around the world. They are having a moment of pausing for prayer at 12 noon. So at 12 noon, no matter where you are, would you take a moment or two and just hold unity, the community, the country, the world in prayer and high consciousness. If we're all doing this, even though we're not physically together, there is a united energy that goes forth that is so much greater than the sum of our individual parts. And so we're starting this pause for prayer today and inviting everyone to join us on a daily basis at 12 noon. Now, if you forget at 12 noon, but you have to catch the clock at 12.10, do it anyway, okay? <laughs> Some is better than none. And the more that we do, the more we will get in the practice and the habit of doing it, and the better it will be. Thank you. Today, our daily words being read by Linda Zwerlein. Good morning to all the faces I can see here and all the faces I can't see outside. I affirm truth for everyone I hold in prayer. I am honored by the trust people place in me when they ask for prayer support. As I pray for others, I see each one for whom I pray as divine and know the truth that each one is a living expression of God. My purpose in prayer is not to focus on the particulars of a situation, but to hold a higher view. As I center in prayer, I hold the vision that all challenging circumstances are moving towards a satisfying resolution in one way or another. I release all thoughts about the situation that prompted the prayer need and focus on the activity of God. As I pray, I see the life the love, the wisdom, and the power of God at work, healing, strengthening, and establishing peace in all those for whom I pray. And from Philippians, I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you. And I'm going to make a brief special announcement. Um, Anna Stone and myself are both board members. We have the idea of trying to gather people as we seek connection but maintain safety for health. So this Thursday from 5.30 p.m. until 6.30, we're going to gather, we'll have some chairs, maybe some, uh, some blankets to sit on, and just a time for us all to chat as we would like. There will be some music that will be playing because if there's some children or some others who might like to just sway or dance with the music, and see if we can create a connection that way. So this Thursday, a trial from 5.30 to 6.30, we'll see whoever chooses to be here and we welcome that. Thank Is you. Inside or outside? We're gonna do outside, thank you. Yeah. On the front lawn. Pardon? On the front lawn. On the front lawn, we'll do the front lawn and then we'll just know that it won't rain. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah. 
Amazing Grace was written in the 1700s by John Newton, who was a slave trader. He renounced his slave trading at age 34. At the beginning of his religious awakening, he wrote this song. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to feel, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, went wild in the stand. What a, what a great set of pipes that girl has. We are really, really blessed by her music. So today we're continuing into our deep dive into some of the um, parables, the better known ones of, of Jesus. And uh, for those of you that know about Unity's stand on the Bible, you might get a little bit nervous when you see it up here. But then there's some others of you that really like the idea of having the Bible present more often. So I want to just remind you that unity is, first and foremost, principle-based. Principle-based and principle-practiced. And that's our truth. But we look to the Bible for many of the wonderful lessons that it gives us, particularly the teachings of Jesus, who is our master teacher. So how many of you are familiar with the, the parable of the talents? About half. That's an encouraging number. Before I get into reading the, uh, the parable from scripture, I want to just share with you some other ideas about talents. And these are from different people. Thomas Foxwell Burton said, with ordinary talent and extraordinary perseverance, all things are attainable. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, every natural power exhilarates a true talent delights the possessor first. Then Franklin, hide not your talents, they for use were made. What's a sundial in the shade? John Gardner, 
True happiness involves the full use of one's powers and talents. It's Maya Angelou. Talent is like electricity. We don't understand electricity. We just use it. I believe that every person is born with a talent. And then, finally, Henry Van Dyke. Use what talent you possess, for the woods would be very silent if no birds sang except those that sang the best. I like that particularly well. So now I'm going to read to you the talents. This is from Matthew 25, verse 14. For it will be as when a man going on a journey called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, one. To each he gave according to his ability. That's an important line, according to the recipient's ability, according to their ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also... He who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of the servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received five talents came forward, bringing his five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I've made five talents more. The master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have, uh, done, you have been faithful over, over little, but I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also came who had the two talents. And he came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. Come and enter into the joy of your master. He also came who received the one talent. He came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But the master said, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reaped where I had not sown and gathered where I did not scatter seed, and yet you did nothing. You should have at least taken it to the bank. And then when I came back, I would receive what was mine and interest on it. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For to everyone who has more, who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken. That sounds really harsh, doesn't it? The time I was a little child and heard that, I thought that was a really harsh, harsh lesson. And I really couldn't get that Jesus, who's loving and kind, was talking about something so harsh. But here's the deal. Every story and every parable that Jesus taught, and it says in Scripture, Jesus taught only through parable and story. Every single one had a number of meanings. So there's a very obvious meaning, and then there's the deeper meanings. Now, I want to just share one thing with you. In my uh, Bible from seminary, which is now held together by rubber bands in both directions, uh, there's a footnote, and it says that a talent at the time that the scriptures were written was equal to 15 years of a laborer's wages. That's a lot of money. So if you just think of, I'm not even sure what the um, minimum wage is today, but the last one I remember was 725 and that was a long time ago. So if you just take that, that amount and you multiply it times 40 hours and you know, we know they worked a lot more than 40 hours a week, right? Then that 40 hours times 52 weeks times 15 years, they come up with a huge sum, more than around $250,000 around $250,000. Now, any place that has a higher minimum wage, obviously, is going to be more. Like California's, I think, is $11. They're going to come out a whole lot better. But the point of it is, this was not chunk change. This was a substantial amount that was entrusted to the servant. 
So it's, it's a big deal. And what is Jesus conveying here? He's saying that the obvious meaning we'll look at is the easy one. And then we'll look at the teaching. The first obvious mean, meaning is this, when you've been giving something, use it or lose it, right? That's, that's an affirmation we can all say with some energy together. Use it or lose it. That was pathetic. Okay, realizing that we are just an intimate gathering here, let's pretend like each of us is at least three people together. Use it or lose it. So just as an example, how many of you have been involved in a rigorous exercise program um, that you've been doing and you've built up and you're really feeling healthy and you're strong and you can either run a lot or you're doing a, a lot of reps in, in the gym or something like that. You, you're doing really well, right? Then along comes the holidays or I don't know, maybe you go on vacation somewhere and you, you don't continue with your, your vigorous schedule for a short time, maybe just a couple of weeks. And then you get back and go, geez, you know, I really got to get back into it. And what happens when you do? It's hard work. The first few times you go back, it's hard work because you have let those muscles kind of just relax. Yes, they have muscle memory and they're going through the motions, but they don't have the same vitality. So you, you have to use it or lose it. Um, an experience of my own is speaking Spanish. Uh, when the children were young, um, I worked and I had uh, a Mexican housekeeper that came and she arrived on Sunday night. We picked her up at the bus station, which was right next to the sheriff's office. And uh, well, the, the Mexican workers felt safe there, which I thought was a good thing. Um, and then we took her back there on Friday night. But she was a very quiet person. Part of it was she was shy, and part of it was she needed a lot of dental work done. But nevertheless, her name was Tildy, and the kids loved her, particularly my youngest daughter. Oh, just loved her. Um, but I had a heck of a time communicating with Tildy because she answered in nods. Didn't get a whole lot of verbiage. So I really had to get into my Spanish that I hadn't used in several years and really dig into it. So I was formulating sentences as I'm driving to and from my office and, and I'm thinking about things that I want to talk to her about and I'm talking to her in my sleep and in, in my Spanish and it got pretty, you know, reasonably proficient. I mean, I felt pretty comfortable going into Mexico and, and made my way around and did, did okay. Was it great? No. Was it perfect? Far from it. But it was usable and people were appreciative of the fact that I was trying. And of course, my favorite sentence to say to them was slow down <laughs> because most people speaking Spanish are native speakers and they speak quickly. And for a neophyte that's trying to learn, it's a little too quick sometimes. Nevertheless, the kids got older and we, till we left and I didn't have any occasion to speak Spanish. And all the time that we lived in Hawaii, there were not a lot of Spanish speaking people there. So um, my Spanish kind of went down the tubes. However, um, part of what I did at my former ministry was I led the, the travel ministry, which was um, travel with a purpose. And uh, we went to Peru. So I needed to be a little more proficient in Spanish. It was humbling to see how much I had forgotten when I was trying to kind of regroup and get my brain in the groove. So it is a matter of use it. Whatever you have, you've got to put it into circulation or you're going to lose it. The second obvious lesson is we've all been giving something to develop according to our ability. Now, in metaphysics, we would say, well, by right of consciousness, we're given something by right of consciousness. We have earned something by right of consciousness. A great example would be our sound tech today, Cindy, who now has the most perfect, absolute God-designed job for her. But boy, did she have to kiss a lot of frogs job-wise before she got this one. But she did the work. She prepared and did the work. And she has an incredible job now. 
Um, we might also say in metaphysics, by right of mental equivalent, we've been given something. So what you're holding in your mind. You remember now, one servant was entrusted with one talent, the next guy got two, and the third got five. But we've all been given something to develop. The third and obvious message in this parable is, yes, we've been given something. We're expected to use it and develop it. But ultimately, it's up to us whether we're going to do it or not. If we choose not to do it and we don't put it into circulation, it will never um, multiply. It will never grow. So if we put it in the ground and hide it because we're too scared, there's no multiplication involved. And it's a little bit like when Jesus told us, let your light shine. What did he say to do with it? Put it up where people can see it. Don't hide it under a bushel. You need to let your light shine. You need to give whatever you have. And you need to do it as often as you can and as fully as you can. Now, I would have to say that a lot of us are not so aware of what our talents are. Our talents are our personal resources, our personal gifts. Uh, they're what we have to work with. And everybody has something. And sometimes what I've noticed is our talent is the very thing that we got in trouble for when we were kids. Okay, so think about um, how many how many successful um, business leaders, CEOs, were told they were a little too bossy on the playground. Probably a lot. You know, they had to learn to to refine that aspect of themselves. But they did learn, and they became very successful. Or how about the fiction writer? This is my, I identify with this one. This is the child who had a very rich inner life and loved to tell stories and was probably told, get real, grow up, get with it. And yet they now write and they are fabulously um, talented and rewarded most generously. Or maybe the kid who always had to be in the front of the class getting all the attention. Anybody know anybody like that? I have some of those in my family. Um, and, and amazingly though, they became great actors or actresses. So often the things that we got into trouble for as children, we learned to develop. And those are the things that we are now recognizing as personal talents. And they have become refined. They've become honed, if you will, or polished because we have used them and we put them into circulation they become bigger and better expressions. So what is all of this about with the talents? What is the whole story about? It's about an awakening of consciousness, an awakening of consciousness. Say that with me, an awakening of consciousness. That's really important. Now the first two servants have something in common. What is it they have in common? They use the talents. They use their talents, exactly. They put it to work. They used it. They used what they were given. They put it to work and it, it expanded. What about the third guy that got just the one talent? He was afraid. He was afraid. So he, he buried his talent to keep it safe. He was afraid. You know, um, I'm not saying that the first two weren't afraid. They, it doesn't mention that. But I would imagine if you were trading or trying to increase those talents there had to be some risk involved you know i would imagine that there was some moment or more of uh of when they felt a little bit unconscious of uncomfortable a little bit concerned about oh what if i lose it but it doesn't say that it says they went ahead and used it unfortunately for most of us starting out we're not like the servant with the five talents we're, we're not like the servant with the two. We're more like the servant with the one because we begin to realize that we have something, but we're so afraid of making a mistake. We're so afraid of doing something wrong that rather than risk it, we hide it away. We tuck it away. We're the kind of person that says, you know, life just happens to me. I'm always in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
things just never turn out right for me. You know, it's it's because of this or that or the other thing. There's always a blame outside myself. If you know anybody like that, if I'm honest, I have to say sometimes I'm still a little bit like that. But consciousness, as it opens and expands, we move from that place, that idea that life is happening to me, into a greater opening and awareness. So if you think about the poor guy with the one talent that hit it because he was afraid, he's still in that consciousness that, that life happens to me. I'm just this poor little innocent blob here and life just happens to me. But then think about, I want you to think about when you got into these teachings and you first grasped the idea of the power of your consciousness or the power of your mind, the ability that you had to, to co-create and make things happen, what happened for you? Apparently nothing. <laughs> okay, let me back up. When I first figured out that I had some power in my words, the power of the word, the strength of the word, and the power of my thoughts, which are also words, um, the first thing I did was start manifesting parking places. Anybody relate to that? Yeah, parking places is your first thing that you do, generally speaking. And then you move on from there and you feel a little, a little bit more excited about what other things can happen. Um, one of my daughters, the one that told me not to wear the same dress, um, is has always been from little, little on, excellent at manifesting things. Um, she could find money floating through the air, I swear, um, and, and did and does. She um, has done this so much that there were people that she used to work with that were kind of like afraid of her a little bit, you know. But the truth of the matter is she knows principle. She knows principle. She knows what you hold in mind and what you give energy, attention to, power to, that is what grows and expands. And that's what she has manifested pretty much throughout her life. And it's pretty exciting. So the two talent mind, the servant that got the two talents, that's the mind that is beginning to open, that's starting to remember, gee, this is pretty cool. I actually can co-create things with God or spirit or the universe or Harry or Sally, whatever you want to call it. I can co-create. I can make things happen. I can help change things. And your life begins to unfold and it, you begin to live it in a better way, a happier way, a way where you are more personally healthy and happy, but also then that you're more productive and more productive with your good in influencing the world around you, your, your immediate world around you. So that second person, the, the two talent guy, he says, life is not happening to me. I can co-create with spirit or with God. And as I am co-creating, greater good is coming forth. He's now saying, life happens by me, by me. Co-creation is a partnership with God or with good or the universe. And the two talent servant represents that experience of growing consciousness where we are more balanced or more balanced. We balance the inner with the outer. We appreciate the feminine and the masculine sides of our being inherent in everyone. We don't have to choose sides. Not one is better than the other. We value that they are there, that there's a balance there. Um, there's a balance in other parts of our body. And the two talent person mind is the one that moves forward with balance and is becoming more and more awake and has a greater awareness. That's the consciousness of the two talent person. And then there's the five talent person. The five talent person is the representative of the mind that begins to spiritualize its senses, spiritualizes its senses. It's easier to write that than to say it. Um, so when you think of five, what do you think of? 
Well, five in scripture usually is indicative of the five senses. So let's just go with that one, okay? So um, Paul in the, in the New Testament says something like, how wondrously and marvelously we are made. And indeed we are. So when was the last time that you thought about your five senses and what your life would be like if one of those was diminished? Any of them. I've thought about it many times. Your sight, what would it be like not to have the ability to see the faces of the people you love, the delight in a child's eyes, the beauty of nature? What would spiritualizing our sight be like? I think it's having a keener insight to see more in the way that God sees. So one of my daily affirmations and my daily work is not to let myself get caught up in the appearances of things. Jesus never said, don't judge. But unfortunately, that's what people have kind of watered down his teaching to say. What did his teaching really say? Do not judge according to appearances but judge righteously, right use of, judge righteously. So judging by appearances is what gets us into trouble. So it's the idea that I need to lift my vision above the appearance. The appearance really is just that. It's just what shows. It's not the depth of what's going on within the person the depth of going, going on in someone's heart or their mind. It's not any of that. It's just what shows on the outside. And we really can't judge according to that. Hearing. Hearing. What would you do if you lost your hearing? You know, when we were kids, we had to do that thing. I, I don't know if we had. Yeah, we did. We actually had to write something about it in school. It was not a good lesson. Anyway, um, the, the lesson was which of your senses would you least want to lose? And for me, it was hearing. Um, sight would be important, obviously, but hearing to be able to hear the voices of the people that I love, the music that I love, the sounds of nature. Um, one of the things that I love in this weather is that about 4.15, the birds start waking up. I have a lot of big trees around my house, particularly by my bedroom window. The birds start waking up. It's a long ways away from the sun up yet, but they're they're waking up, and they're out there and they're carrying on. And as that one uh, one quote said, "What would it be like if only the birds that sang the best sang?" It'd be a very quiet world. But all of them are busy. They're all busy. And I always have in this mind the little mother bird who is saying to to the father bird, "Get busy. Go out there and get food." And I in, in my mind. It's like a Cinderella story. She's got a broom and she's sweeping out the nest. But, you know, it, it's the ability to hear something. So what would it be to spiritualize our ability of hearing? I think it's about becoming more in tune with listening to spirit, more in tune with listening to the wisdom and the guidance that is inherently within us as we are Godlings, we are an offspring of God, we have these qualities within us and being more in tune with trusting that inner knowledge, that intuition. Um, you know, we see God as an infinite presence and intelligence that's equally accessible to every person on planet Earth all the time, 24 7, 365. And to spiritualize our hearing then is to tune into the wisdom and the guidance and the intuition of spirit. There are people who believe that God stopped talking after creation. That's not true. God's still talking and is going to be far after we leave this planet. But it is a matter of making the decision to be more receptive, hearing what is being said. And it doesn't necessarily come through our ears when we are hearing what's being said. 
A lot of it comes intuitively in our gut. Taste. What about the spirit and the sense of taste? If you lost the sense of taste, well, I guess it would come in handy if you're on a diet, yeah. <laughs> you know. But but otherwise than that, I'm trying to figure out what would it be like. What would how would you spiritualize the sense of taste? And my thinking is, it's a sense of discernment. It's a sense of discernment. Again, Jesus said, "Judge not according to appearances, but by righteous use of judgment." And to me, that saying right use of judgment or discernment to know the truth of something we need to be able to discern and determine for ourselves right from wrong of course and if you will the higher or the more truth path the higher and brighter way so discernment is to judge rightly it's to cultivate spirituality touch what is touch how many of you feel like okay I just use the word feel how many of you would you would describe yourselves as being a tactile person, a tactile person. I definitely am one. I cannot just see something hanging in the store. I have to feel it. I have to get the texture of it. Um, and it makes sense to me because life has texture to it. And part of our, our fine tuning in our sense of touch is our intuition to be able to really sense when something is right for me when a change is important for me to make or move to make. Does that make sense to you? That, that's what that touches for me and smell. Have you ever thought about that? You lost your sense of smell. I don't think any of us would want to. I grant you there's certain things we don't want to smell, that's for sure. But smelling is the first sense of recognition. And you know, there are studies that have been done about when they place a, a newborn infant on, on its mother's chest that child instinctively recognizes her smell and turns to her breast for milk. It recognizes the smell. And that is a, a gift that is absolutely necessary. It's, it's, um, it's recognition in the highest sense. And it's a biological necessity for, for the child. So you know, the sense of smell is that thing that catches our memory at the deepest gut level. I remember um, teaching a class to a group of students and these were middle school people and um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with middle school kids, but the boys are in very determined to make sure that everything is funny. And a lot of things aren't, but they can create enough you know, motion to make it funny. Um, so part of the exercise was to have them close their eyes and I would pass around different things for them to smell. And I had a little sprig of pine tree. Um, actually, it's a Balkan pine. I just had a little sprig of it. I mean, the needles were falling off as it was going around the classroom. And I remember getting to one boy in the back of the classroom before he, he sniffed it and held it in his hand. He put his hands down and tears were flowing down his face. And I went, oh, crumb. What have I done now? I never said a word. We just continued to pass it around. And um, so when we talked about what things people connected with, the smell of vinegar, people immediately got that vinegar on that little piece of paper was the smell of Easter egg dye. Okay. The pine was the smell of Christmas. And this boy had just lost a grandparent at Christmas. And he didn't say it during the class, but afterwards when he was leaving, I asked him if he was okay. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, what did you remember? And he said, well, my grandma just passed and my grandma always made Christmas so special. I said, I understand. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks for trusting me to, to tell me that. So just in summary, three servants represented us in an elevation and expansion of our consciousness. The consciousness that does not recognize its own power is the one talent servant. The consciousness that still believes life is happening to them. The two talent servant has a growing consciousness, a growing awareness of expansion and openness, recognizing, yes, I have the power to do this. I can co-create 
and do this. And life is not happening to me. Life is happening by me. And then the five talent servant is the one who gets it. The five talent servant is still involved in the expansion of consciousness and in growing the sensibility of his five senses in a deeper spiritual way. And he's moved beyond that. He says, life is happening through me and life is happening as me. So our consciousness, no matter where we are in the spectrum, is always being magnified. It's always being magnified. And even a tiny improvement in our awakening is going to result in greater good coming forth into our lives. And that's the truth. Namaste. Let's prepare for meditation. And as we close our outer eyes, we open our minds and hearts within to a deeper experience of God. God that is always with us, always within us, always around us. In this time of meditation, we know the truth that we have access to happiness within ourselves. We remember that God is always with us. And as we choose to spiritualize our sense of sight, we choose to see beyond appearances and to see, to look with eyes more from the sense of what the creator sees, more than what we see, but what God sees. In helping us to do that, it changes our whole relationship with how we respond, how we react, and how we move forward. If we choose to see things in the outer world only as temporary, and not as the enduring reality, it is so much easier to find peace and happiness. So as we become more aware of our talents, or perhaps talents that we haven't used much of, we enjoy the opportunity in every moment to express more of that talent, more of that ability, Initially, it may just be as a thought, and initially, it may not be well received because few of us start at the top of our game. But as we practice, it will improve and become more polished and more refined and better appreciated. So moving with the idea of choosing the highest and best always We choose to be open and receptive to what new awarenesses are coming to us and through us about our abilities, what we have to give, how we can give, and how it will bless others, even as it blesses us by enlarging in gratitude, enlarging in every shape and form, by expanding and multiplying by becoming a tangible force for good. So as we rest in the silence, we do so, releasing any tension in our bodies and being open to the new awareness of the activity of God in our lives. Rest in the silence. As we bring our attention back to this time and this place, we become aware of the place we are sitting, the room around us, 
sounds outside. And we come together in one voice as we speak the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And leave us not in temptation, but deliver us from error. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the time in our celebration when we have the opportunity to give our tithes and supporting gifts. And while we are not passing a basket, there is a basket that we put our offering in. And you may put your offering in an envelope and send it in if you wish to do so, or drop it by the office. But let's bless our gifts together. There is no lack or limitation. Freely I give and freely I receive from God's abundance. I am blessed as I give, and unity is blessed in receiving. Thank you, God. And now let's enjoy music from Julie. silently bless our Unity Center, meaning all of the people 
that are connected to our center in any way, whether you've just come here once for an, uh, a service or never come but watched online, you're part of us. So blessing unity, blessing our community, blessing our country, blessing the world, each of us doing this together at that time puts a tremendous amount of energy for good into our world and we see great good coming forth. Kevin's gonna share a word with you. I just wanted to uh, add a few announcements for today. Give me the next slide. Um, just wanted to put a plug in for our life journey groups. We're still meeting, but it's all via Zoom these days. So uh, it actually is not a bad way to meet and uh, it sure cuts down on travel time. So yeah. if you are interested at all, we, we have meetings on Tuesdays from two to four every other week and we have a Monday evening group that meets from seven to nine. We're on summer hiatus, but if you want to get on the list for that for when we start back up, please uh, just give me a call. And uh, my phone number is 414-322-6552. That three in the middle of the typo. So 414-322-6552. So I'd love to see some more people. Also, we'd like some volunteers. Um, I've been mowing the lawn every week and I'm getting really tired. So if anybody else would be willing to uh, mow the lawn maybe once a month, uh, it would be fantastic. Um, just call the Unity office if you think you'd be willing to help. We have a self-propelled walk-behind mower. It's going to take about an hour and 15 minutes, or, you know, something like that. But uh, once a month would be great uh, from now until the grass stops growing. Uh, the, other, the other thing is... Um, it would be great to have some uh, additional people that understand how to use the streaming so that we can get up on Facebook every Sunday. And again, this would be something that um, we can show you how it's done and we have written instructions and then it would be a maybe once a month commitment. It wouldn't be in every Sunday or anything. So if you have any interest in that at all, please call Unity Office. And one last announcement. Uh, this is came out of our latest board meeting when we were talking about doing uh, more connections. So we do want to have outdoor coffee and conversation following our service. And we've got an outdoor area in front of the church. That's the same place we're going to be meeting on Thursday night for that little concert. Um, so if you're interested and you're attending the church, you know, feel free to, to stop outside, uh, grab a cup of coffee, and we'll have some kind of a prepackaged snack that's been sanitized that you could grab and uh, weather permitting, you could social distance and have some nice conversation for a while after church. And for those of you that are still at home, I would like to try holding a virtual coffee and conversation meeting via Zoom. So next Sunday would be the first time. We'd go from 11.30 to noon. And uh, if you want an invite, I'd like you to send me an email. I'll keep this uh, slide on the screen after the service for a little bit. But it's K-M-R-E-G-E-R-5-7 -E at gmail.com. If you send me that, um, I'll send you a, a link for the Zoom meeting for Poppy uh, next Sunday. And uh, do you want to talk about your book study? Go ahead. Okay, so we are just starting a brand new book in the minister's book study on Thursdays. That's a Zoom meeting as well from 9.15 to 10.45. The book that we're studying is How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. And his stance is basically that you are either pro-racist or anti-racist based on whether you're fighting for change that helps all races or whether you're not fighting for change that helps all races. So it's a very interesting book. It's a little challenging for uh, many of us who feel like our hearts are in the right place, but we don't always uh, take that action uh, with our feet. So. Uh, it's a good study, and, and we, we have extra books here. Yeah. If you're interested, they're fifteen dollars. Is there anything else? Kind of. Oh, do you want to you want to give your plug again? Um, sure. Just in case someone joins late. Well, I forgot to say the most important thing that we're going to be outside by the garden, and so we'll be safe, but we'll find connections. So please think about joining us Thursday from 530 to 630. Thank you all. Thank you. We are determined to stay connected.
every way we can. So let's connect now with hearts and minds as we join together in speaking the prayer for protection. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is, and so it is. God bless you each and every one. Thank you for being with us today. We'll see you next week. Thank you all for being here. I just also looked up my head. Who's out there? There was. Should have looked at the mirror every time I come in. I said, but I looked in a picture from the stairs. I thought it looked okay. Oh, sorry. I bought, I thought you can have a uh, coffee. No, for you, you just can't unlock it. Oh, potluck. Right. So I bought that pot for a